So the, uh, the topic tonight is on, um, we're going to cover um, vacuum stabilization of wood and also casting with resins. And the reason we bring those two things together, one is that there's, there's often a, a lot of confusion between the two and, and what you use vacuum for and what you use pressure for. Um, and um, also that, that they, they tend to tie together because um, there's a lot of applications where if you're casting resin that you want to use the casting against stabilized wood. So, um, so that's why it, it, it's kind of a, a natural marriage of the two in order to, uh, in order to do this. So, um, so, but that's, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to start with vacuum stabilization. We're going to talk about the equipment, the materials, the economics of doing it, uh, when it applies, when it makes sense. And, um, uh, and then um, we'll uh, move some equipment around and then we'll go ahead and, and talk about resins and different kinds of resins and, um, and different applications. So- um, They've already started. Well, they're just- so they're the, uh, but, but before we get into it, let's just, I, I, it's important to talk about safety with this because we're now working, in addition to all the hazards normally associated with, uh, with working with wood, um, we're now introducing some chemicals and some pretty nasty chemicals uh, as well. So um, it's, it's very important that you recognize what you're dealing with. And, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of each of the chemicals, but, but know that you, in addition to, um, again, the, the normal hazards you might have with, with dealing with wood, that, that you are going to have to go ahead and, um, and prepare for the chemicals. So some of the things you're going to have to worry about are um, exposure to your skin. The, chemi the chemical that you use for vacuum stabilization, uh, some people are very allergic to it, and uh, just getting it on their skin will create a severe allergic reaction, and they'll never be able to use it again, kind of like some woods that, uh, that you're exposed to. But it, 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 fortunately, it has not been an issue for me, um, but uh, it is important that uh, that you recognize that, that you need to protect your skin when you're using it against splashes. Um, we will, um, you need to protect your eyes. Again, just regular eye guards may not help. Uh, if you're using chemicals, you really should be, when you're pouring these chemicals, you really should consider using a, a chemical type eye guard that has full enclosure around your eyes. Um, I will give you a, a, just a little personal experience on this. Um, the cactus juice, and we'll talk about this later, it comes in two parts. It has an activator uh, that you have to add when you buy in the gallon. And it, it, you won't be able to see it on here, but this little bottle is actually under pressure. And you can tell that because the foil is domed up. And the very first time I did this, I didn't realize that. I stuck an awl into this and, and it actually came out and hit me in the face. And fortunately I had uh, eye protection on and it didn't get into my eyes, but it did splash on my face. So, um, uh, even, even sometimes the most innocuous things can, can create a hazard. Um, nitrile gloves uh, are important. Um, and uh, these used to be really cheap. Now they're like gold. I think they're, uh, I bought some today and it was $18 for a hundred. So um, every time you use them, they're, uh, it's another 35 cents, but it's, but it isn't, it is important to, uh, to protect your hands um, from the chemicals. Uh, other hazards are that the, when you're working with stabilized wood, you, it's no longer sawdust that comes out when you turn it and sand it. it it's really almost like a talcum powder. It's that fine and it, and it coats everything. And so it's very important to protect your lungs from this because again, it's not only this fine powder, which is bad for your lungs, but, but it also is, has chemicals in it. So you, you want to, uh, you want to be very careful with that and make sure you have adequate dust collection. Um, and because it's very, very fine dust, it stays suspended in the air. So even after you finish sanding, if you don't have some kind of air cleaner in your shop, you have to wear that dust protection for um, a while longer until the air cleans, uh, however you're doing that in your shop. Hey, Steve. And then finally for both- Steve, uh, can you hear me? Bob's got a question. Okay. Um, I can't do, hear you, so you have to tell me. Do they recommend a charcoal filter in addition to a dust mask oh, yeah. when you're um, sanding down that stuff to take out any unreacted components? Uh, Jeff, 
And okay. he's asking if they recommend a charcoal filter in addition. Uh, yes, it's organic. Uh, and and it, it depends on whether you're dealing with the epoxies or the, um, the, uh, it, the, the cactus juice, but uh, I, use, I use a charcoal filter when I do it. And that is in addition to the dust filter, you double up, right? Uh, yes. A and again, I, I try to do it outside. Uh, the, the part of it that creates vapors with the vacuum stabilization, um, I, I like the, when I heat it to bake it, I, I do that outside so it's not in my shop. The, uh, the actual vacuum process doesn't generate a lot of vapors. Um, and I have a mist filter on my vacuum pump to, to handle that. But, but you really have to read the MSDS sheet and, uh, uh, that comes with it and then you know, use the appropriate PPE. I, I don't want to get in a position where I'm telling you what to do for PPE because I'm not that expert. But just, just you have to understand it. And, and, and uh, because it's different for each, it's different for the polyurethane resins and the polyester resins and the epoxies, they all have different, different things that you have to consider. The, um, the other thing that, uh, that's important to consider when you're using these um, both systems is that, that you're, you're dealing with stored energy. With the vacuum stabilization, you're dealing with a vacuum chamber. Uh, and you can say, well, you know, what could happen with that? Well, you know, if there are some, you see on YouTube, some people with some homemade equipment that uh, are using things that aren't meant to hold vacuum. And if, when this is uh, under full vacuum, there's a lot of, pre there's a lot of uh, force pulling this lid down. If that lid should crack and break, and get into the material, it'll create quite a, it could actually explode. This is a, actually a glass lid. Um, uh, it, could, it could fracture the lid, it could uh, bounce back and hit you or create a, a splash that came, comes back and, and creates a problem for you. Um, we're gonna talk about pressure pots when we talk about uh, um, casting the resins. And when, the, when my pressure pot's under pressure, uh, there's about 8,000 pounds of pressure pushing that lid off the off the pressure pot. So we'll talk about some of that more later, but but stored energy is definitely a hazard. So not to scare you, but you just, it, it creates, it, it requires a certain amount of respect for and to knowing what you're doing to recognize the hazards and, and to mitigate it. Any other questions on the, on the safety issues? All right. So why, what is resin stabilization, vacuum stabilization? It's a process where you create a vacuum, you put a, a substrate, and this is a piece of a really punky burl. Um, you create a, a substrate that uh, you put it under vacuum that draws the air out of the pores of the wood and, and causes them to be under negative pressure. And with that, um, uh, once you get the air out of the pores, it's like, it's like a sponge. It's, it's submerged in a liquid. And when you release the vacuum, the, the, the resin gets sucked into the pores of the wood. And that resin stays liquid um, until, you, until you bake it. Uh, and this with a cactus juice, it's, it's at 200 degrees. Uh, and the resulting product is a very hard, uh, durable, finish that, that allows you to use some otherwise unusable wood. So um, uh, the products that, that I, you know, the, the, the downside is other than the, the fact that you are adding a chemical to your, to your mix is that it's, it's, it's pricey. Um, a gallon of this material um, and it's, uh, it's the material I use is, is, is called cactus juice. Um, a gallon of this material costs between um, 70 and 90 dollars depending on what quantity you buy it in um, and it, I use there are a couple places you can get it I use cactus juice and this is distributed by Turntex and I'll, I'll put something on the website that has a lot of these sources for the materials but uh, when you buy it by the gallon um, it, it does have to be activated if you buy smaller quantities of this it comes already activated but um, you have to add this little bottle to the gallon and mix it before you use it. And the advantage is that once cactus juice is activated, mm -hmm. it cannot be stored in a temperature greater than 85 degrees or it will, um, it'll start to go on you. So um, 
So you don't want to do that. Um, so without it being activated, uh, when you buy the gallon size, it hasn't been activated. And so it doesn't matter if it gets too hot during shipping, particularly during the summer months and stuff. So, um, uh, and then, but once you activate it, even in your own shop, um, if you're, if you're in an unair conditioned space, you're going to want to keep that in the house or, or someplace where it's not going to get over 85 degrees or it will go bad. So, um, but that's, that's the material that I use. Um, and it goes into, uh, it goes into a, um, into a vacuum chamber and there's two up here on the bench. Um, this one is one that uh, will hold a 12 inch diameter piece uh, about six inches thick. And here's one that will hold uh, things like pepper mill blanks and those types of things. So um, either one of these works. Uh, the, uh, the pot one, uh, you can buy them from Turntex, but um, I, I found, had good luck with a company called Best Value Vax that has, uh, that, that has these. Um, and I actually have three, I have these two and I have one more that's 16 inches in diameter that, uh, that allows uh, some, some bigger pieces in it. Uh, so the equipment, in addition to the vacuum chamber, um, you need uh, a vacuum pump. And I don't use the vacuum pump I use for my, um, um, for my vacuum chuck just because this stuff gets into the system and um, I don't, I don't wanna pollute my other system with it. So uh, this is just a, a cheap Harbor Freight vacuum pump the, that's used for uh, HVAC applications. And uh, what's important with the vacuum pump for this application is you don't need to move a lot of air. Um, but what's more important is you need to be able to get to 27 and whatever the theoretical maximum is for your altitude for your maximum vacuum. Around here, it's about 27 and a half inches of mercury. Um, but you want to be able to pull that, that full vacuum. It doesn't have to pull, again, doesn't have to pull a lot of volume like your, um, um, like your vacuum chuck may need to do on a piece of porous wood, but it, it does need to pull um, a, a high vacuum. And, and the HVAC pumps are set up to do that. So again, this is a, a cheap Harbor Freight. And, um, um, and as a matter of fact, this is fairly new because the one I was using for several years before this one finally um, uh, stopped working a few days ago. And, um, but typically I, you have to change the oil. What's the other good thing about these is you can change the oil on them. And before I use this on, on resin, I will put a pre-filter on it. So, and a, and a mist filter on the exhaust. And so you're not getting mist in the air when you do it. So, anyway, so you need a pump. Um, and you need an oven. Um, whatever you do, do not use, uh, the oven in your house. Uh, this is nasty stuff. First of all, you don't want to do it in the house. Um, I, I went to a thrift store, store and found a used toaster oven that could hold a 16 inch round pizza in it. It's a fairly good sized toaster oven. Um, and I've been using that ever since. Uh, it's dirty and cranky, and, uh, but, but it continues to work. And it's nice because it'll hold the maximum size piece that I can, that I can put in a vacuum chamber. At, at temperatures between 190 and 200 degrees, Absolutely. you have to get to that temperature but if you, you just can't set it too high or it'll all evaporate out before it sets in your wood. So it's very important that you maintain temperature control. The temperature controls on most toaster ovens are not anywhere near accurate. So um, I found it very beneficial to have uh, one of these little, this was a $35 um, temperature probe that uh, this was made by a company called Therm Pro. But what's nice about this is my, this, I put the probe and what I do is I just wrap the probe in foil and stick it on top of the, the, the piece of wood that I, or the wood samples that I have in there. Um, and then um, this has a digital readout on, on this, but it also has a remote display. So I can bring this piece, the remote back into my shop and I can set it for a temperature. So I have it set for 210 degrees. And if the oven should go above 210, it alarms and tells me that, and I can go out and make the adjustment outside. Because if you don't, if it gets too hot, like I said, it, it just evaporates all the resin out of the wood before, before it has a chance to set in there. And, and then you've just, now you have an expensive puddle underneath the, uh, 
in the bottom of your oven. So um, there are some people uh, on the internet that, that wrap their, their pieces in aluminum foil before they put them in the oven. Uh, I have found that that does not help uh, retain the resin into the wood and it makes it a terrible mess to try to clean up that because the, the foil is all stuck to the blanks and you end up having to sand it off. And I, I, so I just put it on, I put, I lined the bottom, um, the bottom shelf of my oven with foil. I put a shelf above it um, where I put the wood. And so the drippings don't go into the element in the oven. And, um, uh, and then I, and then I do it that way. So the, the, my blank is sitting on the rack rather than the, um, uh, it, rather than wrapped in foil. I just see no, no need at all to wrap stuff in foil. It just, it creates, it's just very difficult to get it apart. So anyway, so that's, uh, that's what I use for temperature control. Um, All right. Um, and then finally, the, the wood has to be dry before you put it in the vacuum chamber. Um, if you don't do that, uh, it, you're trying to displace water and it, it contaminates your resin and uh, it doesn't work nearly as well. So what I do is I'll take my blanks and just throw them. I don't even I don't worry about checking moisture in it. If if it's air dried, I, you don't do it at all in green wood. But if it's air dried wood, I put it in the uh, the oven at 250 degrees for 12 hours, and and I find that I let it certainly let it cool then before you put it in your in your vacuum chamber, uh, and then um, uh, and then that that's usually I found that to be dry enough for anything we need to do. And again, I'm not doing big pieces. Bob um, and Steve, we have a question. If you do have a bowl blank, a a piece that's you know a large piece of burl or okay. I can't hear. Does the wood stick to the rack in the oven? Does the wood stick to the rack in the oven? Um, sometimes, but not normally because the, the stuff drips down to the foil below it. So on, on the shelf below it. So it's just sometimes you just need to knock it off, but it, 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 it typically is not a problem. I haven't had anywhere I couldn't get it off. Any questions? Nope, that was it. All right. Um, so um, you need to start out with it dry. I was talking about if you, if you do have a bowl blank, the first time I did this, I had this nice 12 inch bowl blank, about four inches thick, really nice spalted wood. And, um, and I, I put it in there and, and I realized that it used a half a gallon of, of resin for this piece of wood, you know, and, you know, that's $40 worth of resin. And then I ended up turning out the inside of the bowl and turned $20 of that resin away. So, um, if you if you aren't going to core the piece, rough out your blank first, and then um, and and then cast it, you know then and then put it in the vacuum chamber and stabilize it. But um, it, it is not economical at all, in, unless you have such an incredible piece of wood um, to to go ahead and and to to stabilize just whole bowl blanks. It just doesn't make sense to do that. Um, we'll talk about later that some of the work I've done with burl and some of the hybrid pieces that I've um, but you know, you get four cores out of it and then that makes it, that makes it, you know, much more economical to do it. But, uh, but it has to be a pretty, pretty nice piece of wood in order to justify the stabilization process. Um, just a quick example. Uh, the other thing you can do, you can put dye in the, um, in the, in the resin when you do it. Uh, I use alumilite dyes, uh, that are, uh, these little bottles of, of dye that you get from, from alumilite, uh, and uh, you just put that in there. This jug, this is a, a just some of the some of the dyed product uh, that I and so when I'm I'm doing a dyed piece, I I just use the the colored stuff. You know what's nice is that when you're done, what's left in the pot is still good to use, and it, and it keeps for a very long time. So it's not like a, a where you, you know, an epoxy or something like that, what's left over is gone, it, it sets. This stuff, if it hasn't been baked, it, it, it stays good for a long time. But just to give you an idea that some of the differences between a dyed piece, um, uh, here's two pieces. Uh, hold these better. I'm trying to reduce some glare. So, um, you know, this piece is, is a piece of burl. It's a burl slice. I'm, I'm making charcuterie boards. And, uh, 
and that that's been stabilized without the die, and then this piece has been stabilized with the die. I don't know whether you want to zoom in on those or whether you can see them any better. But yeah, if you can just see, and it, it really does make the grain pop. It's there's no finish on these boards, all right? They've just been sanded, and uh, um, and I I just put it, I put them on the the wax wheel to buff them, just to give them a little bit protection from fingerprints, but there's no finish necessary because the finish is actually impregnated into the wood. All right. So depending upon the piece you're, you're using, um, so in this pot, there's actually, I, I just leave, I, when I, I use this pot most often and um, I just leave the resin in there. I, I just, I, I put the lid on it and, you know, um, it, it'll stay for months. And so uh, when I need to add more, I add more. Um, I do have a couple of brass rods sitting in the bottom of this to just pick the pieces up off the bottom. So you tend to get better, uh, better distribution of the, uh, the vacuum inside. And um, I just have a variety of, of steel weights that I put in there uh, on top of the wood just to keep it from floating. Uh, when, when you do it. Um, and you want to make sure that the resin covers whatever wood you're using. You need, you need an inch or so of liquid above the highest point because um, at some point when you release the vacuum, all that liquid is going into the pores of the wood and, and the, the volume level will go down in the um, and, or the, the, the resin level will go down. And if you don't have enough covering the wood, um, you'll have parts of it that, are, that aren't getting impregnated. Um, a lot of discussion about how much time um, to do this. Um, I'm gonna show you a demonstration here in a minute about what it looks like when you turn one of these on and it starts sucking the air out of it. But what I have found is that I err on the side of, you can't, you can't keep it in there too long. Uh, but if you don't keep it in there long enough, you don't get full penetration of the resin. So um, it, it depends on the piece. Uh, some of the bigger pearl, pearl pieces I'm in there, I'll have it under vacuum for several days. Um, I have a question. What, what I found is, and yeah. can you start and stop the process if, say, example, you discover that you didn't have enough resin to cover it? Can you start and stop the process if you were to discover you didn't have enough material to cover it? Yeah. So if you if if you find that as you um, as it starts coming down, and so I'll watch it. If it looks like I'm getting close to it, so at the point that it's you've released all the vacuum, you can take the lid off. So if you've released the vacuum and take the lid off, and you see it starting to go down, and you think you may not have enough before before any wood's exposed, you can add more resin to it. If you end up with if you leave it and you come back and you got a half an inch of wood exposed. Um, uh, that, that's been exposed, you, you just have to add more resin and put it under vacuum again to, to get it out of there, uh, to get the air out. But, but you do have an option. You do have, you do have some freedom uh, right when you release the vacuum to watch it. You can take the lid off. And if it looks like it's going down, um, if it looks like it may not make it, then just add some more to it. Um, is this a two-part um, thing where you draw a vacuum on the wood, then put off. the resin in? Jeffrey was asking if there's a two-part process, process where you draw the vacuum down and then put material. No, the, the material is submerged while you're drawing the vacuum. So the, the it, it bubbles up. You can see bubbles forming while as you apply the vacuum. So it's submerged and then you release the vacuum while it's submerged and the and the material gets drawn into it. So the pores are put under negative pressure. There's negative pressure in the in the pores of the wood. You're sucking the air out of the pores of the wood, but no resin's going into those pores until you release the vacuum. It's like just releasing a sponge. So if you were to squeeze a sponge and stick it in a bucket and release it, that's what happens when you release the vacuum. It just it pulls pulls the water into the pores. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's okay. All right. Um, so that's that's the process. So. So you release the pressure. So I, I added a valve onto my pot here. It didn't come with 
this 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 valve. So the vacuum's coming in this side. Um, focus down there. Okay. So the vacuum comes in here. I have a quick connect that goes to the vacuum pump. Um, and just a word of caution that that most quick connects or some quick connects don't work with vacuum. Um, there are special quick connects that are are designed for vacuum. I happen to be lucky enough that my old company was getting rid of a bunch of stuff that they use vacuum pumps a lot. And I had some access to, they, they were getting rid of all these quick connects. Otherwise I wouldn't use quick connects. I would just, I would just thread the fittings on, but, but a normal compressor quick connect is meant to work under pressure, not under vacuum. So, um, uh, and it, they'll, they'll still connect and while they're connected, they work, they just don't seal it. But, um, but I put a valve on the, um, on the upstream side of this. So there, there's really no need to run your pump um, the entire time. So I'll watch this. I'll get this up to, uh, on this gauge, it'll be up to the point where it's almost up to full vacuum. Um, it's got a glass top there. I can see what's happening and, and the air bubbles are coming out of it. But once it reaches up to almost full vacuum, I just, I turn off the pump. I turn off this valve to look, to seal the, the, the pot and I turn off the pump. There's no need to run that pump continuously. And then it'll start to bleed down as some of the air comes out of the wood. And then you turn the pump on again. Uh, but, but I don't run my pump. When I'm doing these multi-day um, vacuums, I don't run it at night. I don't run it typically when I'm not anywhere near the shop because, you know, a pump could burn up on you or lots of things could happen. So, Part is um, full and that's, so that just saves your pump by not running it, you know, for three days straight. So, you know, in the evening, I'll, I'll come down. I'll, I'll seal this off. I'll turn off the pump. And if it's, again, if it's a big piece, it's going to require multiple days. I'll just come back the next morning and turn the pump on again, open the valve, turn it up, bring it back down, turn the pump off again. And so it just depends. And a, a piece like this might take two or three hours till the, till the, uh, till the bubbles stop coming out of it. Um, and that's when you know you've, you've achieved the, where you want to be is there's no more air in the pores. There's no more bubbles coming out of it. Um, the question was, what is full vacuum? So, um, question is what is full vacuum uh here it's about 27 and a half inches of mercury 27 and a half 28 somewhere in that range i don't remember the exact number but that's that's your maximum maximum theoretical that's one bar uh, but it's it, it varies a little bit based on elevation but we are not that far above sea level here so um it's it's about 27 and a half, 28, somewhere in that range. And that's most vacuum pumps, that's all they're gonna pull, unless you get a really, really high dollar pump that may pull a little bit more. But uh, about 95% of theoreticals about what most of these pumps will pull. Um, so, so now we've got to the point where we've gotten all the air out of the pores of the wood. Uh, it's all the pores under negative pressure. And we, we slowly release the vacuum. You don't want to do it too fast or it'll cause a lot of splashes inside your, your tank. You open this valve, you open your venting valve here, you release your, um, your, your vacuum and you can watch, just watch the fluid level in your tank go down as the, the material gets sucked into the, um, into the pores of the wood. Now, there's a lot of people say, well, you should, you should how long do you leave it in there? And it, um, it's a law of diminishing returns. So, um, but I tend to, again, if I'm not in a hurry, I'll just leave it in there for a couple of days. I don't, I don't worry about it. But the rule of thumb for smaller pieces is you leave it in there for twice as long as it took you to achieve the vacuum. Um, I don't worry about it. Again, I'm usually not in a hurry and sometimes it's in there for a week and I, I just, you know, but if you're in a hurry, you can use the twice as long as it took you to get all the bubbles to stop coming out. Um, I, I will say one other word of caution when you're applying the vacuum, depending upon, and, and you'll see here that the, the material will tend to foam up and you don't want it depending. So the port on this pot is sitting right at this level here, right where the, where the gauge is. You don't want to be sucking resin into your vacuum pump. Um, so you may have to adjust your vacuum with this vent to keep it from getting too much vacuum too fast uh, and, and to keep that foam down. And it only takes a few minutes. Once, once you get the, the bulk of the air out, and again, I'll show you on this clear one here what, what that looks like. But, um, but you, wanna, you want to uh, just make sure you're, you're watching it when you're first applying that vacuum to make sure that uh, 
you're not you're not sucking the uh, the resin into your vacuum pump. I do have a a filter on the in both inlet and outlet side of my pumps. It's a trap that if I do end up sucking something in, it'll get caught in the filter before it goes into the pump. So, um, any questions on this? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you. I have water in this tank, and, and you can just zoom right into that, Bob. Um, so rather, because uh, you just just bring it down a little bit, or maybe you have to zoom out just a little bit so you get the whole thing. Okay, that'll work. So this is uh, this is this actually came from Turntex. They they have they sell this. Um, you'll see it's got a gauge, it's got an inlet, a quick connect for the inlet, and then it's got a vent on the top here. Um, this is water in here, not not cactus juice, uh, mainly because I, you know, I'm not going to do anything, but also from a safety standpoint tonight. Um, and that's just additional water. So I'm going to stick these two pieces of wood in here. Uh, Just have to do one of them. I'm just going to do one of them because it's a little too much. And I just have a weight that I put in there just to, to hold it underwater. And put my lid on. And there's just a rubber seal on the bottom of this that gets held on with vacuum. I'm going to start it with this vent open. Right. And as I close this vent, see, and I had that, that fluid is very close to the top. But it'll start drawing vacuum. Maybe. And that's that that foamings with water in there. If that was cactus juice in there, it would uh, it would foam up even more. So um, let's just zoom right into right into that. Bob. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see the bubbles, but anyway, it's it's pulling. It's walls well, doing. It's just pulling that out. So that would essentially sit there, and you'll see the. Uh, this, this needle will eventually peg out on the top, um, but it'll just continue to pull that and uh, until there's no more bubbles coming out of it. And, um, and again, a piece that would two by two by six, that'd be, uh, you know, it'd probably be in there two or three hours until all the bubbles stop coming out of it. But right, you can see right now, it's still, still pulling enough air out of there that it hasn't reached anywhere near the theoretical vacuum yet on there. So, so that's the process for uh, for vacuum stabilization, and then when you're done, you would just release it, and uh, um, this, um, and then the, the water level gets sucked into the piece. All right, any questions on that before we leave the vacuum stabilization? All right, if you can just give me a minute here and let me switch some of this equipment out of the way. So I've got a quick question. Uh, 
Will you use tongs to get the piece out? Because I'm sure it's gripping. Uh, question is, would you use tongs to get it out of the cylinder? Um, so it depends. So when I'm working with the pot, I just use rubber gloves and go in there and get it. Um, if I'm working in the cylinder, uh, typically I'll pour the, I'll just pour it because I don't store anything. I don't store the cactus juice in the cylinder. Um, I'll pour it out carefully into the back. I have a funnel, a big funnel. I stick in the jug. Um, and uh, I just, so I'll take this, put it in the jug. I'll pour it out from the cylinder back into the, uh, um, back into the jug. And then, um, and then just reach in with my rubber gloves and take, get the piece out. Tongs don't, it, it, the wood is very heavy. <laughs> um, uh, it's two to three times heavier uh, after it's been stabilized, depending upon the wood um, than when you put it in. So um, yeah, I typically just use gloves. Have you ever, or is there even a reason to stabilize wood that hasn't gone too far? Say it's just a little bit funky. Is there a benefit? Uh, the question is, is uh, there ever a reason to stabilize wood that's not totally funky, but just to get in that direction? Going that direction? Sure. So there's a lot of times where just, a, you know, you'll have a bow blank that just has a, a small piece of it that's, that's punky. Or, um, you know, there's been times where I've, you know, I've, um, I've roughed out a bowl. I've let it out of green wood. I let it dry. It's all dry. I'm trying to go to finish it. And I'm just getting, you know, it, I can just tell there's, there may be some sap wood that's just not, uh, that's cooperating. It's just a lot of tear out or, you know, rather than using CA, I'll, I'll go ahead and stabilize it. And the thing is the resin's only going where the, the soft wood is. If you have, if you have hard, dense wood, um, it's going to be really difficult to get the resin in there. So, um, but, but yeah, I have, I have done stuff and, and a lot of people use it again to, to, as a dye. So if you want a dye that goes completely through a piece and uh, you can even use, there's people that do double dyeing where they'll dye it in one color and then they'll put part of it, they'll just suspend it in the vacuum chamber and just do part of it before they bake it. They'll go ahead and just put part of it in a different color dye and double dye it. And uh, you don't have to use the full vacuum chamber. Um, you can actually take a cup like this and stick it down in there. So if you're gonna double dye something, you could put a little bit of cactus juice, you know, just put it in the bottom. If you had a piece that that long, you could just put it in there, set it in the bottom of it, stick this in the vacuum chamber. So you don't need a whole lot of, of, of dyed um, resin to do it and then just run it. And so again, you can, you can put a smaller container in the big container. So you're, uh, you get more efficiency in your, uh, in your product. Let's talk about resin uh, and casting resins now. Um, so I think most people are familiar with uh, casting resins um, and why you would do it. Um, you, you do them to create a blank or to create a hybrid or some people just turn um, just totally resin pieces. Um, so there's two parts of this. You can use it to create a blank and you can use it to fix defects in wood uh, or you can use it to, um, to fix cracks or you can actually use it for enhancements um, of, of certain pieces. So you can, you can cast lots of different things. I tend to cast um, burl. Uh, the, the primary thing I do is I, you know, I usually cast burl into, into resin of some sort. Uh, these are bottle opener handles and just various things um, that it allows me to use some smaller pieces um, and, uh, and, and, you know, incorporate the, uh, uh, and I'll show you some of the, I mean, they're called hybrid pieces when they have both wood and resin in them. So, um, so they, um, 
there's different types of resin uh, for different applications. And the, what used to be the, one of the more common ones was polyester resin. Um, no problem, it's working. Uh, so polyester resin inlace, uh, a number of people have used inlace. Uh, inlace is a polyester resin. And you know it's typically a polyester resin when you have a just a very small bottle of activator. You know, you activate with drops rather than uh, large volumes. So um, it, um, you know, that that's, but polyester resin, first of all, is it's expensive. Um, and um, it, it is lower cost than, than some of the other ones, but it's very, very noxious. Um, you cannot, should not use it indoors. Um, you need really good um, respiratory protection on it. And uh, it's, it's really not very common now. It's used to fill small things, but it's not really used for, for large scale casting like we're gonna talk about tonight. So once you get past the polyester resin, there's really two types of resins that, that are out there. Um, and then there's subsets of these, there's polyurethane resin. Uh, so Illumilite, uh, is one of the brands that I use most often um, and had very good success with it. But Illumilite makes a polyurethane resin. Uh, it's called, uh, it's either Illumilite Clear or Illumilite Clear Slow. And the only difference between these two is one has five minutes of working time. The other one has 12 minutes of working time. Um, the advantage of uh, a polyurethane is it, it sets very quickly. So it, it, between five and 12 minutes, depending upon which one you're using, um, it has very low odor. Uh, it can be dyed easily. And, uh, but because it sets so quickly, it requires a pressure pot in order to make it clear. So, um, I, I don't know how well you can see that, but maybe just zoom into this piece. But, but if you, you can, if you, if you look at this piece, and this has a, no polish, this is right out of the mold, but, but it is, they call it optically clear. If you were to polish this piece, um, there's no air bubbles in it, 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 it is clear. Um, so it, that's the advantage of, of casting under pressure. Um, so, but, but the polyurethane, because it does set so quickly, you have to use a pressure pot in order to get the air bubbles out. And it, and it doesn't get the air bubbles out. What it does is the pressure pot makes them microscopic. So you, you can't see them. Um, but what's nice is that I could cast a bottle opener blank in the morning and turn it that afternoon. I mean, it sets that it, it's got, even if I use the slow, it's got 12 minutes of, of working to, of open time. And, um, uh, and it within, an, within two hours, you can, you can demold it and turn it. So, so very, very quick, very quickly, you can, you can use it. The problem is that because it generates, because it sets so quickly, it generates a lot of heat. It's an ex exothermic reaction. And um, we're going to talk when we show uh, some of the pieces later, you'll see that because of that, you, you really can't pour it very thick. Um, it's not a problem when you have something this thin, but if you had a, a large piece that you're pouring uh, more than an inch thick, it's very prone to cracking, to have a thermal crack get into it because of uh, because of the heat that's generated. The way you mitigate heat generation is you have it cured very, very slowly. And so you have to you have to go from the polyurethane resins now to the epoxy resins. So um, there are a number of, of epoxy resins out there uh, for different applications. Um, Illumilite just recently came out with this Illumilite deep pour. Uh, and I'm going to show you a piece that I used uh, this on uh, the first time I've used it very successfully. Uh, they say they say two to three inches max. Um, I had mine was almost four and a half to five inches thick. So and I didn't have any trouble with it. One of the advantages I have is I have an air conditioned shop and I actually lowered the temperature in the shop to account for some of that. Uh, I also cast it under pressure. Uh, you don't need to use a pressure pot because it sets so slowly. You can use either other means to get the air bubbles out, but because it fit in the pressure pot, I used it. Um, and um, it took, uh, it was still tacky at 48 hours. 
So in the, the pot that I mixed it up in, I just kept checking it and it, and it took, it took over two days for it to set up to the point where um, I'd even consider it um, set, but I, it, it was probably, it, it, it was probably um, five days before it was fully cured. And that's about what they say is that give it a week before you turn it. So uh, there are other epoxies that you can use that uh, I use epoxy called liquid diamond that is somewhere between this and this. It was, it's set in about a day and you could turn it after two days. Um, again, you have to be careful where the thickness goes, but the advantage is that if you have something that sets in hours rather than minutes, you can, um, you can use either a torch or a heat gun uh, on your piece to, to, to bring the bubbles up to the surface and, and to get, you see the guys that are casting these big um, river tables, that's what they're doing. They're using these really slow set epoxies and they're using a torch or a heat gun over the entire surface multiple times in order to bring um, the bubbles to the surface. And that's the way to get rid of the bubbles. So, um, so that's, those are the, 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 the three. And this third one here is something that I just got that I haven't used yet. Um, but I've talked, I showed you, I was making charcuterie boards that, uh, that, that I've stabilized. I have some bigger ones that I want to make that don't, that are bigger than the 16 inch pressure pot. I want to, I want to infuse them with something that will keep them from staining and make them very durable when exposed to, you know, fruit and wood and or uh, fruit and cheese and those types of things. We don't want them to stain. And uh, uh, this is a, a penetrating epoxy uh, made by Total Boat that they use for um, impregnating rotten wood on boats. Um, and it sets very, it's very, it's, it's water thin and, um, and it, it sets very slowly. So it has time to actually get down into the wood. So it, it doesn't build any surface on the wood. It gets down into the pores and then eventually it causes, it, it sets with a chemical reaction. I have not used that yet. I've seen other people use it uh, with some success. Um, so um, I'll let you know how that works, but uh, it's also an epoxy, but it's, uh, it's a, just a very, very low viscosity. Um, the, the polyester resins, I'm sorry, polyurethane resins are mixed one to one by weight. So you mix these with a scale and um, you just weigh them out and, um, um, uh, and, and you put equal, equal, equal parts A and B uh, and then you mix them. And what I do is I mix them in, in two different cups and then pour them together in order to, uh, uh, because the, your working time is so short. The epoxies typically are two, two parts and one part and some of them are two, two to one by volume. Some of them are two to one by weight. Um, I tend to convert everything by weight because it's a lot easier to measure accurately by weight than, than by volume. Um, if you look at the markings on, on a mixing cup, I mean, you could easily, easily get, get something wrong uh, on here. And so um, I, um, I have for the, the different products that I use, I know what the unit weights are for each part. And I just, I just go ahead and, and mix them up by weight rather than, uh, um, rather than by volume. I find that works much better. Um, so mixing is very, very important. I will show you a piece a little later, a picture of a piece that uh, what happens when you don't mix it sufficiently. Um, it either doesn't set and uh, you end up with soft spots in it, or um, it's um, it gets wavy inside the piece. You can see it's not it's not homogeneous inside the, the piece. So um, and so it's very important that you mix it, and particularly if you're mixing large volumes. Again, that's if you're doing a large pour, it's a real advantage of using an epoxy that sets in hours rather than minutes. When you only have you know five to, to ten minutes of open time, and that means you have to have it under pressure within those 12 minutes. So that's not, even the slow is 12 minutes. It's not a lot of time to make this work. So um, if you're gonna do a large pour, you don't wanna use um, the, the polyurethane resins. Um, I use a variety of mixing pots and mixing methods. Um, when I, uh, the, the big pour that I just recently did, I used, I poured a gallon of it and I used uh, these very large, these four liter buckets. Uh, 
And for that, because it was epoxy and I was going to, and I actually had the ability to, to, to cast it in the pressure pot. Um, I have these, uh, this, it's just a mixer. It's a, it's a, a glue mixer that, uh, that you can use and, uh, and you just put it in the drill and it mixes it up very well. Um, for smaller pours, uh, you can use uh, a variety of stir sticks. I just take, uh, these are tongue depressors and I just put them on the, uh, the belt sander and, and get a nice flat end on them. And I, I do a hundred of them at a time and stick them in my bin. Um, you can use uh, paint sticks uh, that, uh, uh, or very often I'll use um, just rubber spatulas. And these, the advantage of this is you can get, you can actually scrape the sides of your, your bucket. Even when I use other means, I typically just take the rubber spatula and, uh, and, and clear the, the sides of the, the, the mixing pot. Um, you'll find that once you start casting resin that you're always on the lookout for various containers that either to use as molds or mixing things. This is, uh, this is a bucket that birdseed came in and uh, it's actually a great size for making, uh, uh, for, as a mold for making parts. Uh, you'll find that um, if you, these, you know, these things cost a couple dollars each. You don't want to be throwing them out after each pour. They're almost impossible to clean, but if you just let the, whatever resin you're using set in it, you can actually just squeeze these things together and, and typically get either pulled off the sides or pulled out of the bottom and, and, you know, you just keep using these things over and over. Um, so, um, it, don't wipe them out when you're done using them because if you get a really thin film on there, you can't get it out. But uh, if you just uh, just tend to do it, so um, so so that's the mixing. Um, they're easily dyed. Uh, there's a variety of dyes you can use. Um, there's lots of companies making dyes um, from a lot of different places. Again, I tend to, and, and most of these dyes are interchangeable. Um, I tend to go with mostly the, on the liquid dyes, the lumalite dyes, uh, and I use them for both both the um, the polyurethane and the epoxy um, resins. Um, a little bit. This dye is very very concentrated. I'll leave it down here so you can just zoom into these. Um, for a, for a six or eight ounce pour, um, one little drop on the end of a toothpick is all that's required to, to dye a, uh, to get a, a, a pretty deep color like this. You know, this probably had, had one or two drops on the end of a toothpick in order to achieve that color, that, that deep color in there. So you don't need much. Uh, if you use too much, they, if you're looking for something that's opaque, that that's totally, um, uh, color, then, then you can use more. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can put these pearl powders in. Um, and these are, these are typically, these are typically mica powders. Alumilite makes them um, and other companies make them uh, as well. This company is ma made by Pearl X, um, but, but they're, um, but these, these give you the, uh, the pearlescent effect um, you can kind of see it a little bit in this piece, but I'll show you it better on some other pieces. Um, you can see it in the top of this piece. It's that, uh, that sparkly effect in there. Um, and then I have not used these yet. Uh, these are alumilite uh, poly colors. These are powdered dyes that, uh, that um, and some are metallic, some are pearl, but I find the pearl essence makes a makes a really ni nice effect uh, in in the pieces, and it it tends to it also tends to hide some defects if you if you have to repair something. Uh, um, with the with the polyurethane resins, because they set quickly, the way I I do is I I, I will mix up the entire batch in one bucket. And I'll pour a little bit off. I'll I'll pour a little bit off into a separate cup, and then I will let that. Um, I'll dye the parent bucket and pour that into the mold. And then I've learned from experience that um, 
when this material, when, it, when I have it in the mold and it reaches 95 degrees, but it's about to flash. I have about, I have about a minute to get this thing done, but it also gets more viscous at that point. So I'll take the second, the, what's in the second cup that has a pearl powder mixed in with it and just pour it over the mold and maybe stir it in a little bit, maybe not. And then button it up under pressure. And, and again, I have about a minute to do that pouring, get the lid on the pressure pot and get it under pressure. And, and I'll show you some pictures of some, some finished pieces that have a, a very swirly pearl effect in them. Um, that uh, that's how I achieve that. But, but the way I, I do that is it, this is just an infrared uh, temperature sensor and you press on it and point it at something and you can just watch it and you can just watch the temperature go up. I mean, I shop 70 degrees to start with and it, and it gradually climbs, gradually climbs. And, and I've just learned from experience that 95 is the magic number uh, to make that work. Um, as far as molds go, Let me step out of the way here. Steve, if you use a alcohol-based uh, dye with a with an exothermic resin, would that uh, would the dye start it trying to evaporate inside the resin and create voids or anything of that nature? I, got um, I, I have not, I have not had that. I have not had, the, 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 it's a, it's a thermal reaction that's due to, that's due to heat shrinkage when it, it gets very hot and then it shrinks as it cools. And that's what causes the, the cracking. Um, I haven't had any that have pulled out of, I mean, if there's a void inside something, um, actually, and I forgot to mention, uh, it is absolutely essential that if you're casting resins, that the wood, the wood um, has to be dry, has to be very, very dry. So that's one of the reasons I tend to stabilize anything that I'm gonna, any wood that I'm gonna cast resin against, I stabilize first, because I know it's dry. There's no moisture in there because all that moisture has been displaced. But if you, particularly with the polyurethane resins, not so much with epoxy, but with the polyurethane resins, if you have any moisture at all, you'll get a white foam um, on the surface of what you're doing. Uh, it, and it takes just a little bit of moisture. You, you do it on a humid day, it can be dry. So, so it's very important that, that, that everything be very dry. Um, that's one of the, the downfalls. Epoxy is not as critical, but it still will, you still get some, if, if there's moisture in it and you get heat, the moisture gets drawn up through the wood. And uh, so, so having a stabilized, I, I, it's one of the reasons I stabilize everything I do that, that I'm casting resins against. Thank you. All right. Um, if I'm doing my larger hybrid blanks, I tend to use, these are HDPE cutting boards. You buy them by the package. Uh, they're usually, you know, 24 by 30 or something from Amazon. And you can make a variety of different sizes. Um, I just cut them into circles and And I use, um, this is also HDPE. And the, the beauty of HDPE is that most of these resins don't like to stick to it. So uh, uh, I, I just take this, all I do is I just hot melt glue this, uh, this flexible, this thin flexible HDPE to the edges of this. And I have them in different sizes. And um, if it's a six inch pour, I'll use a six inch piece, but I just, I just hot melt glue it to the edge of this. And then I, and then I just, just to make sure it seals, I just put tape along that, along that bottom edge too. Um, and I just, I just tape it and I'll, I'll show you that, that process here in a slideshow in a minute, but that's when I'm doing the, uh, the bigger pours, that's what I do. Um, the, um, one other thing that I have found really helpful and it's going to be hard for you to see it, but there's actually a little hole right in the middle of this, um, this base. And when I cast this, resin goes into that hole and it gives me a little nub. And so I know where the center of my blank is. Um, and it makes it very easy to put my glue block on. So um, 
you know, that there's a, just an advantage of doing it that way. Um, I just, I, I found that by accident, I put that in there actually to put it on my circle jig, but, uh, but having that little, little nub on there makes it very easy um, to center it when I'm done. So that's, that's how I cast the bigger blanks. These smaller blanks, like these, uh, the bottle opener blanks, um, I use PVC pipe and these are tailstock pieces for drain, for, you know, uh, for drains. And they're just a little over an inch in diameter. But what's nice is they have this, this nice flange on the bottom there. And all I do with these is I take them and I just hot melt glue them onto a, uh, onto a piece of HDPE base. And I'll, I'll, I'll glue three or four of these down and uh, put them on there. Um, and so I use this for my bottle opener blanks for, for also I have it just, I just keep a variety of these other pieces if I'm doing something bigger, you know, just, uh, just thin wall PVC. And again, I just use hot melt glue. Um, there's some people that use uh, a silicone caulk and other things, but the beauty of hot melt glue is it sets up very quickly. Um, the other thing I do is I, I keep my hot melt glue gun handy as I pour the resin in. So if I have a problem, I can, I can fix it. Um, but, uh, but that's, uh, I just used, you know, again, just, just various pieces of P PVC pipe and I use them until they get too wonky and then I throw them out and just cut some more pieces. Does um, the heat one thing that's really important chemical, to do. Does the heat generated by the chemical reaction ever melt the hot glue on you? Does the heat uh, created by the chemical reaction ever melt the hot glue? I haven't had a problem with that. Um, but on the bigger pores, which are done in these, I always have tape. I always put tape along the bottom anyway. So um, I, I don't, this is mold release. Uh, it's a company called Stoner. Um, anytime I'm casting in a, in a round mold like these, I use this mold release and the, and the, the pieces just slide right out. Um, when I'm doing these bigger pieces uh, where I have the thin material on the sides, I, I just peel this stuff off. I don't have to worry about it, but, um, but, you know, you see some of the YouTube people doing this and they don't use mold release and they're beating these things out of here or they're, they're using the bottom of a five gallon bucket for a mold and they're, you know, just, just having a really hard time getting it out. But, um, but this mold release, it's, it's like magic. You just put it on there and it slides right out. But the downside is you can't spray that until after you hot melt glue it because the hot melt glue won't stick to it either. So, uh, so um, if you were to, put that if it's on your base. So I, before I hot melt glue anything down to one of my bases, I just wipe it down with denatured alcohol and, uh, and, and, and go from there um, and glue it on. So, so we got, um, let me just show you the pressure pot real quick. So this is a, this one is a paint pot that you can now actually buy these that are set up for by the same company. Um, that don't that were not converted from a, being a paint pot, but this was actually for uh, uh, spray painting. And there's a what used to be an auger here in the middle that I took out and just put this heavy bolt and washer in there instead. And that's the the major modification I made. Um, so it's got a pressure gauge, it's got a regulator for the pressure going into it. And then it's got a relief. Uh, it has a, a safety valve on it that's set. This is this particular pressure pot. It's set is rated for 90 psi. Um, I have the uh, I have the safety valve set for 80 psi. So if we if it hits 80 psi, if the regulator gets screwed up and it hits 80 psi, that this safety valve will pop off. Um, and then I just have a a valve for releasing the pressure after I uh, when I'm ready to take the piece out. Um, it's got a, a hefty lid on it with four, um, four strong wig nuts that, that do not rely on, you know, a bolt pressing down on the, on the point of the lid. If you look at the Harbor Freight pot, um, it's not nearly as beefy as this. And I think the Harbor Freight pots are rated at, at 60 PSI. Um, you probably only need 50 PSI in order to get the air bubbles out. I run mine at 75. But I have, a, I have a, a regulator here that's set for 75 PSI. Um, I hook it up and once it's under pressure, if well, if I'm doing the epoxies that take days to set, I leave my airline connected to it. 
Um, if I'm doing the um, polyurethane, it takes an hour to set. Once I get it up to pressure, I disconnect my air. I just turn it off and take my airline off it. So, but uh, again, you have to be careful with this. Um, it is under pressure. And like I said, there's about 8,000 pounds trying to lift that lid off there when this is at 75 uh, PSI. So um, the other thing I have done is um, I put a donut in the bottom of it. And you can tell I have had some stuff leak. But what this does is it allows me to get, if something does leak, I can get it. It's not glued to the bottom of the pot. So uh, it just, it, it doesn't stick. The resin doesn't stick to this very well. This is just a piece of uh, composite decking. And uh, uh, the hole in the middle is I, there occasionally will cast something that has a chuck attached to it that allows me to put the, uh, the, the chuck in the bottom of it as I'm, if, if I'm holding something in a chuck. So, but I just, I just set that in the bottom and um, it just allows me to, to make sure I can get the pieces out when I'm done. Um, let me just talk about finishing here. So we're probably not going to get to the lathe tonight, but um, so to, to finish the, the resins, let me just talk about cutting the resins. Run out of room here. So, my go-to tool for um, working on on the resin pieces is a negative rake scraper uh, with a fifty-degree occluded angle. Um, and you can this one was about twice as long when I started doing this work, but um, it's got a slight curve on it that I put on it that allows me to get inside of bowls. But um, this, and, and realize that when you're, if you're doing a composite piece where you now have stabilized wood, which is hard as a rock, and, and now you have this resin, which is much softer, but very brittle, um, it, you know, just the transition between those two cuts is, uh, is very challenging at times. But, but this is, is by far the most effective tool, this negative rake scraper uh, for, for doing it. Now, it's... When I'm doing large bowls, and the one I'm going to show you here in the slides, um, I never turned off my grinder. I would sharpen this every minute, um, and I have, I, have, I have two or three of them, and I would sharpen all, all two or three and then um, use them and then go sharpen them. But uh, um, you, you have to be, it has to be sharp because it, if not, you're going to start chipping it out. Other tools that uh, are, are fairly effective for maybe removing larger volume, this is a Hunter Osprey. Um, and it's hard to see that there, but, um, it's got a carbide, it's got the Hunter carbide tip on it, but the advantage of this is that it's a bevel cut. It's not a scrape. So, um, there are times where you, particularly when you're into the, uh, stabilized wood where a bevel cut's going to give you, uh, some better control. So, um, the other tool from Hunter, which I don't have, but a, a number of people are now using is the Hercules tool, which has a similar, uh, you can see it has a kind of a negative rake approach to the uh, wood. And so um, that, that is also effective. Um, and then typically a gouge, I, I don't use a gouge in the conventional way uh, when I'm, because it tends to chip. If I, if, I, if I have to remove a lot of material, I'm not really worried about the rough surface, I might. But typically I'm gonna use this in a shear scraping mode where I'm gonna have it almost vertical. Um, on the tool rest and I'm cutting just with this, just with this edge here uh, in, in, in almost a vertical orientation. And again, it's, it's more of a scraping motion, but it does allow me to get a little bit of bevel cut on it, a bevel uh, support on it when I'm doing it. But to use this in the conventional, um, um, you know, gouge mode, um, it's, it's, it's gonna chip out that resin. I, I find, I don't find it effective at all. And the problem is that once you get chips, they're really hard. Um, it's just, you have no choice but to, to remove everything around it until you get to the bottom of that, that chip. So, um, so I, I make my final passes with the negative rake scraper. Uh, I do my final shaping um, and then I go and sharpen it and make one more just feather light pass on the piece. And because what you wanna do is you wanna avoid sanding with high grit sandpaper. Uh, if you were to sand with 100 grit sandpaper on resin, you're going to put scratches in there that you're never going to get. I, 
I don't want to say never, but are going to be very, very difficult to get out. So with, with good tool work with a negative rake scraper, I like to start at 220. Um, because, uh, and all I'm doing is just taking off some of the high spots, if there's any ridges or anything in there, but um, I'm not putting a lot of scratches in there. I dry sand it um, to 400. Um, and again, uh, good, I run my dust collector the entire time I'm turning it because I want to try to capture all that, particularly with the stabilized wood, you want to get all that fine dust out right, right at its source. Um, and then I switch to wet sanding and I wet sand and I just have a spray bottle next to the lathe and I wet sand, I start with 600 and I go to a thousand um, and then I go to 2000 with uh, wet sanding. And then you can buy some um, resin, some polishes for epoxy. Uh, what I find is that uh, they're very similar to automotive compound and these are much cheaper. This is uh, turtle wax. Uh, and this is the heavy duty polishing compound, the red. And um, so I go that, and then you, you go through the polishing steps with that. And then I just use white um, after that, uh, the white polishing compound. And again, this is just turtle wax polishing compound. And that's how I, that's how I finish the uh, acrylic pieces. Any questions? All is quiet. Is there a solvent to uh, clean this, all your tools up and things when you're done? Uh, well, it's not liquid. Well, so if the question is, am I cleaning up like the spatulas and the mixers and the turning tools, they're not, they're, there's nothing wet on them. So there's nothing to clean up. I mean, they're just, it's all dry. So no, you don't need no. a solvent to clean them. No, I mean, when you're mixing things I up. Mean, for, no, when, you, when you're mixing things up. Oh, when you're mixing things up? No, because um, what I, I showed you how I clean the buckets, I just wait till it dries and I squeeze it. And the same thing with the rubber spatulas and stuff. I don't, I, uh, on the mixer, um, I don't know where it went. Um, that mixer, it's, it's just flexible. So I clean this up. I let I actually just let the stuff dry on there, and then I just flex it off, and it just pops off. Well, that's even better. Um, I've mixed. I've used this one. I don't know a dozen times, and it's pretty clean. So, um, and then the molds are clean just because this you use the mold release on them. I have a question. All on right, the, I'm going to run you. Question of RPMs yep. for the people who have been turning bowls. For quite a while. Okay, I started for the people who have been turning bowls and just regular wood for quite a while. When they go to using this resin and such, do you need to lower your RPMs quite a bit or do you do the same? What do you do? Um, so you, it is a, it is a lower RPM. You have to give you have to give the material time to cut. Um, and so if you're using a scraper, it's gonna not cut as fast as you would have with a sharp gouge on wood. So you, you're gonna have to lower your RPM. And the other thing is, the other killer is heat because the heat will, some of these things will soften the resin and um, you know it, it, it actually gets gummy on you. So you don't want that. Um, or the heat can actually cause it to crack if you, if you overdo it. So um, yeah, Terry, it's a, it is a, a lower, you, you do have to turn a little bit slower, but it, there is a feel to it. Um, and it depends on, you know, whether you're doing a bowl or a, uh, you know, a bottle opener handle. I mean, you can obviously turn this at a much higher speed, but I wouldn't turn this at the same RPM that I, that I was just, if it was a wooden spindle that I was turning, I would turn it much slower. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to switch to a PowerPoint here and um, I'm just gonna go through the process of, um, of, of a casting a hybrid blank that I made um, that some of you may have seen. Um, so can all of you see that all right? 
any problems with it. All right. So this is a, uh, a piece of burl that was uh, that I got from Mike Smith that had been laying outside for a while, it was very, very punky. Uh, I stabilized it first. Uh, and then I just, the, the top of it was kind of dark uh, because it had been weathered. And so I just, I coated it with epoxy uh, resin and then just sprinkled some pearl powders, different color pearl powders on it. And then it's sitting on one of those HDP bases and you can see the start of the, uh, the mold being formed on there. Uh, that's the completed mold. You see, I got masking tape along that bottom edge to, to seal it in addition to the hot melt glue holding it on. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the piece placed into the, uh, the pressure pot. So again, one of the advantages of using the pressure pot will hold the five gallon bucket. It's just a little over 12 inches. If you were to use a, a, a wider mold material, you're then sacrificing diam maximum diameter that you can put in the pressure pot. So that really thin HDPE cutting board allows me to maximize the diameter that I can fit in the pot. Uh, also, if I were to pour this outside the pot and try to put it in, first of all, there's no way to hold it, but also it would be very heavy. Uh, this blank, when it was finished, weighed 35 pounds. Um, so that's the blank. I don't have a picture of it uh, with the mold, but that's that's the blank um, that uh, as it came out of the, the pressure pot and I took the mold off and you can see the pearl effect on the surface there. And this was done with epoxy. This wasn't done with the polyurethane. So this is the one that took, you know, two days to set. So I just, I poured it, I poured the base color and then I just had the second color and I just poured it very close to the surface. So it didn't you know, it didn't splash when it went in and I just, I buttoned it up. I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out, but it ended up with a, a fair amount of, uh, of uh, you know, nice swirl in the, with the pearlescent colors. And that's just white pearl with no dye in it in a second cup. Uh, and this was a gallon, this was, it, this was a gallon of resin as I poured it. Um, this is the bottom and a couple of things I would just want to point out here. So I, when I, when I do these big pours, I, I just put a couple spacers underneath the, the block of wood because a lot of times there's voids in the bottom as well. And if, you, if a piece is sitting down tight to the bottom, um, the, the resin often doesn't get in there. So you have to glue the spacers down to the HDPE base and then you have to glue the wood to the spacers or else the wood will float up. But right in the middle of this, if you look right, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, you can, that, that's that little nub that I was talking about that uh, that um, that where the little hole in the in the uh, the base was, and that allowed that's my centering point for my glue block. So, I always, almost one hundred percent of the time when I'm doing a blank like this, use a glue block. I do not trust the resin to create a tenon for me to hold this. Plus, I don't want to lose that depth of creating a tenon. So, um, this, like I said, this blank was. Um, 35 pounds and I was going to core it and coring puts a lot of stress on, on a tenon. So this is a six inch glue block. That's a one way stronghold chuck. Um, you clean the bottom with denatured alcohol. I actually turned the glue block in the, in the jaws of the chuck, uh, drilled an eighth inch hole in the center of it while on the lathe. And then without ever taking out a chuck, glued it onto the uh, glue block using that little nub to center it. And it, so it, it allowed everything to be perfectly centered. And I just used um, 15 minute epoxy to uh, epoxy it on there and let it sit, let it cure for a day. Um, it's important that you clean the bottom of that piece with denatured alcohol hall before you, you epoxy that glue block on there though, or it will not stick. Um. All right, and that's the piece mounted on the lathe uh, and, and ready to core it. Coring was done with uh, the one-way coring system. Uh, and I used, uh, after this I'll show you, but, I, but uh, Hunter Tools has come out with a carbide cutter that goes, it's a diamond shaped cutter that goes on the end of the, uh, replaces the one-way cutter. And uh, it's great, it's, it's really nice to use. And again, the challenge for coring this material is you're coring both resin and super hard stabilized burl. So um, 
it's a, again, a lot of stress on the, on the tenon. It's also a lot of stress on the coring equipment. A, a real nice part of this is that um, with the, um, with the one-way system, you never have more than about an inch of that cutter extending over a support. Um, so uh, even when it gets a little bit warm, it gets a little sticky, um, it, it, it cored it very, very well. You can see, and you'll see on some later pictures, there's almost no, no chip out on this uh, as we went along. Um, I did ended up doing four cores of it, um, and there they are. And uh, another, another nice thing about the uh, using the one-way system is you can use tailstock support with, you can see I have an extension on my uh, live center um, that allows you to provide tailstock support, which reduces vibration, but it also keeps that if the bowl should come off, you know, this isn't wood that's going to bounce. This is, this is plastic that will break. It's very brittle. So if it should come out and bounce off the, the ways in a lathe, it's going to break. So, um, by having that tailstock support in there, which you can do with the one way, um, it really makes a big difference in, in the, the, your chances of success on this cut. Um, so now, so that's, that's one of the blanks that came out. That's the second to the largest blank. Um, and you can, if you look at that, uh, there's, it's, it's a very, very smooth cut uh, considering you're cutting in and out of that, that the burl and the, um, and the resin. So, because the wood was stabilized, it's, it's, it's airtight and the resin's airtight. I, so right in that picture, all it is, I used a cone center and I used that to um, hold it up against my vacuum chuck. And you just uh, right here, you can see it. I just centered that manually using my tool rest and I got it dead on because again, you're, it's plastic. It's not moving like wood does. And it was a very clean cut coming into it. And so I just, I got it centered, you know, using my tool rest as a guide um, and then turn on the vacuum. And, and you can see right here why I had to use the cone because there was a, a little knob there that, uh, um, um, that, that would have, you know, I didn't know where the center was. So the cone just fit right over that piece. And again, this was only a half an inch thick. I was trying to maximize, I was trying to get four cores out of it. Um, I didn't want to waste thickness. Uh, so the wall, the sides were half an inch, the bottom was five ace. Um, again, if I had put a glue block on, or if I, if I had, you know, tried to put a tenon on there and hold it with a chuck, it wouldn't have worked. So I cut the, the, the outside with it on the vacuum chuck this way. And I ended up, I just turned it around. I just put a minor recess on the bottom to, so it would sit flat on the table. And then I, uh, I turned it around and used the vacuum chuck to, for the inside. Again, I didn't have to remove a lot of material on that. So the vacuum chuck worked great. And uh, that's the finished set, the, the four pieces. And there's no finish on these. Um, they were, what you see there is just, it's the stabilized wood, the burl stabilized with the clear um, uh, cactus juice. And then the, uh, uh, and there's no polish or anything on those pieces. That's just, that's that white uh, turtle wax polish that, that came on there. And uh, there they are opened up. Uh, it turns out the middle one really didn't have any burl in it, but I had it. So I, I just left it in there. It just had two little tiny pieces in there. So, um, so that's, that's the process to, 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 to use to, to create one of those hybrid, hybrid pieces. So the other thing you can do with, uh, any questions on that? Okay, everybody awake? Yeah. <laughs> All right, the other thing you can do is you can use the, the resins to repair defects. And um, so this is a, a crotch piece. Um, it's about 18 inches in diameter and two inches thick. Um, had several checks in it that were uh, significant. Um, so I took this and uh, I, the one thing you need to do is you need to make sure you clean out, you need to get all the bark off that, where that crotch piece is. A, a, epoxy, none of these resins will like to stick to bark. And, uh, and the bark is, you know, even if it does adhere to it, the bark isn't adhered to the substrate very well and you're gonna end up with a problem. So you, you have to remove the bark, whether it's burl or a crotch or whatever you're doing. Um, so again, that's just, and what I did to prevent bleed out or bleed in of the resin into the piece is I coated that with the, uh, I just 
I just brushed on clear epoxy uh, into that and let it set. You could use sanding sealer. Um, because of the size of this, I just used epoxy so I didn't have to use multiple coats. Um, and then, um, I, unfortunately, I don't have a progress picture of this, but again, it's a, uh, it's just a, a, essentially a serving tray, but I just used uh, epoxy into that. I, I used the slow set epoxy. This was too big to go into a pressure pot. So I used the uh, slower set epoxy and I used a heat gun. Um, as I put the epoxy in there, I just used a heat gun to, um, to get the bubbles out. Uh, what I did was I used the HDP, the, that thin HDPE cutting board material. I just, I just hot melted glue to the bottom of this and to the side, uh, to this part right here. And on the top, I just put a bead of hot melt glue all around this crack. So I could build up the epoxy in there. And if it wasn't perfectly level, I didn't have to worry about it, but um, it just gave it a little bit more uh, area to build it into. Um, and then that's the back side of it. So that's just one, one way you can use it to repair. And you can see on the back side that there, there was a knot here. I, I poured some in here. And again, I just put I just put hot milk glue around it to build a little dam and then poured it in. And I did the same thing with this crack right here on it. Um, and uh, it's a, uh, again, that piece is about 18 inches in diameter. Um, not sure I like the color, but it is what it is. <laughs> Um, here's another piece. There was a crack in a, you know, this crack happened, um, after, after I turned it, um, and it, and, and finished turned it, uh, and it, and it dried and it was already dry, but, um, it, it was turned very thin just because it was a thin piece to start with. And, uh, this crack developed after it was finished. So it was only about, uh, it was less than, a, it was probably three sixteenths of an inch thick at that point. Uh, I didn't want to um, lose the piece that you could have probably maybe used CA glue in here, but I used epoxy with, with um, uh, brass powder in it. And uh, I put it in there and I, I used a heat gun to actually get it to flow down into the crack and to make sure that this area down here, um, uh, it, it, it flowed into that area as well. So it's not very thick at its thickest point. Um, actually, that's probably almost life size right there. It's it's a little less than an eighth of an inch at the rim, and it, it goes down to nothing over here. And again, because this happened after, uh, I was worried about it continuing to move. So I did. I put a pu couple butterflies in there just to uh, it, they're functional and just for you know just for the effect in there. So, um, but uh, so that was that piece that uh, again it was a, just a really nice piece of burl, and I didn't want to lose it, so I used it to. Uh, um, to repair that piece. Um, this was a piece of really punky burl. Um, all those, all these lines in here are bug voids or not voids, but there, it was sawdust from bugs getting into it. Um, so, um, but, um, I ended up turning a mirror out of it. And, um, so I stabilized this piece when I stabilized it. It, it the um, all those all the sawdust and all those voids got firmed up, and again that's that that's that effect you see here. But it also had a couple of uh, uh, chips out of it that that had come out. So I used a epoxy and brass powder in here uh, before I turned it in order to fill in that areas here and, and a couple other places on the rim. There's you can just see a little piece up there with the brass powder in there. So again, just just trying to salvage a piece that otherwise would have been uh, would have been wasted. Um, this is, uh, I've showed this before, this is a piece of wormy pecan uh, that was literally, you could break this apart with your hands. Um, I stabilized it uh, in the vacuum chamber and then um, um, cut it round on the lathe, uh, on, on the bandsaw, and then just filled in with a uh, uh, an epoxy resin and um, um, with some pearl powder in it. All right, so things don't always go well when you use resins and epoxy and um, you learn by your mistakes. Um, this was the first nested set that I did. And this is, I used the um, polyurethane resin 
And this is after the repair had been made. But if you look at these two arrows here, there's actually a crack in this bowl when I took it out of the pressure pot. Uh, it was probably a little over an eighth, maybe uh, probably almost 316 at its widest point. Um, and it extended from the rim all the way down into the middle of the bowl. And it was due to, it was a thermal crack. Again, it had gotten too hot. And as it cooled, the, uh, the plastic shrank. And uh, fortunately it was just one crack. And so I filled it with, um, I filled it with a, a resin that didn't quite match. And you can see it right there is where on the finished product where it was. But fortunately, because this had a kind of a variegated uh, appearance to it, the, the crack really wasn't all that obvious because it, it kind of blended in with, um, with the other pieces, but it was in three of the four cores that were in this, in this bowl. So um, um, again, it, it, but that, that was a lesson learned not to use that resin for a, a, for a pour that's that deep. You, you really need to go with a, a resin that's meant for um, a much slower set than that. Um, this was, a, I mentioned a sphere that I turned that um, it was either a thermal problem or I'm thinking I didn't mix it well enough, but it was cloudy. Um, and um, so uh, this piece actually sat on my bench for almost two years after I turned it, um, not knowing what to do with it. And a number of people said, wow, that's really cool. It's because it's, you can't see it in the picture, but it's kind of a, a cloudy, it's not really cloudy. It's kind of a ripple effect. It almost looks like uh, wavy water in there. And um, so um, I just made it part of the piece. <laughs> after, after sitting on my bench for almost two years, I decided to, uh, to see if anybody wanted to buy it. So, um, uh, but that's, that is a, again, I, that's after I did this piece, I, I bought the power mixer for my larger pours and I haven't had any, any similar problems on that since. Um, here's another problem uh, on a bowl that I was doing when I was doing some of my router work. Right up in here, you see this arrow is, there's, when I poured, I cut these grooves and on the, the parts of this where this was end grain on the inside of these grooves, the resin bled into the, into the parent wood. And you can see it here and on this side, here and this this is actually maple it wasn't this dark and so i you know rather than you know i i attempted to stain the wood darker in order to try to mask that and it, the whole thing turned out very ugly so this this is this is uh in the reject pile but there's a real danger when you do stuff like this if you're dealing with end grain that that resin will bleed whether you use pressure or not resin will bleed into the end grain um and on this particular bowl, if, if you could see the side grain, it didn't, you know, where you have some of the side grain, it, you don't see that, that same effect, but wherever there was end grain, it just went right into it. And it, it was so blotchy, particularly on before I stained that maple. So um, the, uh, the remedy for that is to, uh, here's a, a different cherry bowl, but you know, the same, same um, effect, ribbing effect in it. And on this one, I used uh, two coats of sanding sealer on the inside edges of all those grooves before I cast the resin in it and uh, didn't end up with any bleed into that at all. So, um, so lesson learned there. Any questions on any of those? All right. Um, and finally, uh, we'll just wrap this up here. I, I would just like to just show a couple of, uh, you know, photographing um, pieces with resin that are usually very highly polished is, is very difficult. Um, it's not difficult, it's challenging, it requires some. And so um, I spent some time with John Vaith uh, uh, just playing with different things to um, different ideas on how to photograph it because you can really get some pretty dramatic effects and John is far better at it than I am. Um, and um, I don't know, is John on? I don't know whether he's here tonight. Um, um, so one of the, some of the challenges are it's difficult to reduce glare um, or to eliminate glare on, on polished resin because it's like glass. Um, you can try varying your light angle. You can use a reflector. You can use a diffuser. Um, but, but sometimes you just have to accept the fact that you're going to get some, some glare on your, on your piece because it is highly polished. Um, backlighting can be used to uh, enhance the pearl 
or the the translucent effects of it uh, very effectively. And the key is to try all sorts of different multiple lighting setups. And I'm just going to show you a couple examples of of some of the things that John did on these on a couple of pieces that that showed that highlights the different things you can do. Um, so here's a, a piece that uh, uh, it's uh, four pieces of burl um, with uh, resin cast around it, and this is done with the polyurethane resin, and this is just the the second the pearl color just poured into it right. Um, just before it, it's set, you know, at 95 degrees. So you can see in there, there's very good separation between the pearl and the, the base color on there. Um, so that, that's one effect. Um, there it is, just a, just a little bit lighter, uh, a little bit more light coming through the back. Uh, there's, a, he, John put a, a diffuser on this and uh, actually shot the light through the piece um, to get the, uh, the effect on the back, um, you know, it, very interesting shadow coming through on the back. Um, and then uh, again, a, a similar effect that uh, with just a, a, different, a different lighting situation. So here, what's interesting here is now you see the effect of the pearl really on the front of the piece. It really highlights the, the, the reflection of the pearl powder um, right on the surface of the piece. Whereas some of it, when you backlight it, sometimes it shows it with its depth. So very different effect as to where you put the light and where your shadows are. And um, so, but, but very artistic, uh, John was very artistic in, in, in achieving different effects with that. And so I guess the, the, the point of showing this is what is to just play with different things and different lighting effects if you're using, uh, particularly if you're using the, uh, the pearlescent powders. And then finally, here's just another piece and, uh, um, shot one way without, uh, you can see some of the effect. Um, but there, again, uh, with just bringing some light through the back of it, it, it just tends to highlight the, uh, the pearl powder um, even more. So, and that's my presentation. <laughs> uh, any, any, any questions? Come on, <laughs> anybody awake? <laughs> Yes, right. Steve, uh, uh, I have a question. Well, there's a question. Can, oh, there's a question. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So, uh, Steve, you, you've shown us uh, three processes for uh, stabilization. And as you saw from my punky uh, Cypress resin screwdrivers that I turned uh, last month, you know, I, I didn't use any of these best practices. So my question is, when do I need to use them? You showed us uh, cactus juice um, and vacuum withdrawal to stabilize the wood. Well, if I've got a solid wood, do I, do I really need it? And then there was the, um, the, the oven drying. Uh, if I've got my wood stabilized, it, it kiln dried to six or eight percent, do I really need to go to oven drying? And the last is the pressure pot uh, with the with the resin. I understand that you know that drives the the air out and the the bubbles, but you know I've been able to do that painfully uh, by just you know pouring resin into the voids and let it dry and pour the resin into the voids and repeat that five times without buying a pressure pot or the compressor that goes through it. So, I mean, if I don't have punky wood, do I need all three of those processes? If I have stable wood? Um, so it, it depends on, it depends. <laughs> um, if you're doing larger pieces, um, even with, with, and, and the, the opinion on whether you need to stabilize the wood or not is it's entirely up to you. I've seen a number of people that don't do it. I've also seen in my own work that pieces that I did not stabilize and poured resin against them, that um, after finishing and when they were exposed to a different humidity, you ended up with a bump between because the wood swells and the resin doesn't. So you end up at that interface if you run your hand over it it, you, you can feel the, 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 the jump in the, in the piece. So um, those big bowls that have, um, 
that that nested set of bowls had um, two hundred dollars worth of materials in it uh, between the resin and the stabilizing juice and the burl itself. So, do am I going to do everything I can do to make sure that that doesn't come apart and that stays together and gives me the best chance of success? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, but um, my bottle opener handles, do I need to do it? Probably not. Um, I just do it as a matter of course, because I, I will tell you that, that if you're using polyurethane resin, the, the, the rapid setting resin, if you do not do it under pressure, you will get air bubbles in it. There's no way to avoid it. It just sets too fast. If you're using epoxy resin that sets slow and you can put a heat gun on it or a torch, um, that, that will help you get the air bubbles out. And if it's a thin pour, you're probably fine. If that, that platter that um, I repaired, that the, the crotch platter that, that had that, the, the big purple patch in it, um, that, that wasn't stabilized and um, it wasn't cast under pressure. So yeah, you can do it. And there's no air bubbles in it because I took the time, I used a very slow setting epoxy um, and used a heat gun as I put it in there to, uh, to get the bubbles out. So it depends on what you're doing and, and, um, and, and what you want to achieve with your, with your final result, whether it's an art piece or a functional piece or, and again, how, how big it is, I think is probably it. As far as it being um, oven dry, um, I think that's very important. And if you, uh, with the humidity around here, I'd be surprised if very much wood is at 6%. It may be 6% at the surface, but um, uh, that, that's a very low moisture content. So if it's truly 6%, you're probably okay with epoxy. But if you're using polyurethane resin, um, even, the, even the surface humidity on that wood will, is going to cause that polyurethane resin to, uh, to foam or, or to maybe foam. So that, uh, that answer your question? Yes, Steve, thank you. That answered my question. And I'm going to go out and look for a cheap used toaster oven. Yeah. Well, That's yeah, the th thanks. Well, thrift stores are a good place to look. Not for the pouring, not for the casting. No, even it, if you're using polyurethane resin, you should you should oven dry your work before you cast it. Okay. I'm, it, you, I'm you, pretty you, much always using epoxy resin, either either deep pour or for three eighths of an inch. Um, you know, uh, regular surface pour. So, right. The, the, the moisture is not as much of an issue for epoxy as it is for the polyurethane. So, you have a lot, it, if you're air dried at 6% or something, you're probably okay with, with epoxy. Polyurethane, not so much. Okay. Thank you. Steve. If, um, I, if you're familiar with Gorilla Glue, Gorilla Glue is a polyurethane glue that sets with. Actually, in order to set it, you use moisture. You put moisture on one surface and you put the two pieces together and it foams up. That's that the, the glue, that's that polyurethane glue reacting with the moisture on the pieces and that causes that foam. So um, it, the polyurethane resin is just a subset of that. Any other questions? Yeah, Steve, Mike Bulat. Have, have you ever had a piece uh, separate while turning? Um, I have not. Um, okay. and I think part of that is uh, probably just due to the preparation and, and the care. I, I shouldn't say that. I, I think one of the, maybe one of the first bottle opener handles I did where I didn't get all the bark off um, that, that may have, may have, I may have had a problem with that. And it, it didn't come off while turning. I think it just cracked. Uh, it might even crack coming out of the mold, but um but I haven't had I haven't had any of the big hybrid bowls or anything like that crack, um, um, and I and I, I I think a lot of that is just due to the stabilization process. 